Hello and welcome to my channel. I'm Jason White. This is Jason's Weird Reads and today I've got a TBR video for the spring of 2022. These are all books. There's 10 of them here that I'm hoping to get to. Uh, hopefully during this uh, the warming up months <laughs> of uh, this this crazy this crazy year. All right, so there's 10 books here, as I just mentioned. I'm gonna be reading you the, the synopsis, and I'm gonna be needing my readers for this, probably, because my my eyesight's getting worse and worse. Uh, first up here, I have uh, a book that was sent to me by uh, somebody who wants to uh, uh, come on my channel and, and discuss this new collection. And uh, I was sent the parcel, which I got in the mail just last week. And uh, he sent me an extra book along with it. So let's get into what this is. So the book is Fit for Consumption by Steve Berman. It's a collection of, uh, of short stories. I'm going to get into the synopsis in just a bit. But I wanted to show you also this extra book that he gave me, which is really awesome. It's called uh, Monstrous Mythologies. And it's by Michael Bukowski. And it's a really, really cool book because it uh, it has like all different kinds of monsters in it and just little bits of information about the monsters inside of it or beside their names. And the art is really cool. And I'm, I'm not too sure why he sent me this extra book, but I, I completely appreciate it. And thank you, Steve, if you're watching this for for showing me this. And in case you're interested in getting it, it's called uh, Monstrous Mythologies. And it's by Michael Bukowski. So that that's really, really cool. And now on to Fit for Consumption by Steve Berman. In Berman's newest short story collection, the phrase, you are what you eat, is taken to heart. These are stories of men facing strange appetites with their own physicality, with a within a lover, or perhaps a stranger's hungers. A young athlete attends an exclusive wrestling camp, but some of the campers are, uh, fo are more focused on the unwelcome boys they claim lurk inside their bellies. A fix-it man on a mission to retrieve a runaway finds himself forced into impersonating a pulp hero by her captor. Life as a pledge at a New Orleans fraternity is made all the worse when a magical, perhaps cursed, flask that fills with whatever the bearer desires, yet also causes the drinker to desire the pledge. Within stories, <laughs> with stories inspired by Edgar Allan Poe, H.P. Lovecraft, and Ramsey Campbell, the menu has 13 tales that range from the weird to the humor noir to the monstrous no digestive is necessary <laughs> so to get a maybe a clearer view there we go so i'm looking forward to getting into this collection and talking with steve uh, sometime in the future hopefully shortly and i also have to message him because I, I forgot to message him i just realized now i forgot to message him to thank him for the <laughs> for the package god i'm i'm horrible Okay, uh, on, along the same lines, um, it was like last year in 2021 when Bill Richardson, he, uh, he contacted me uh, wanting to see if I would review um, Hellfighters. And, and so I said, yeah, sure, you know what, I'll get, I'll get your ebook. And if I like it, maybe, uh, maybe I'll ask for a signed physical copy. And he was like, you know what, I'll just send you the signed physical copy now. And so, so he did. And, uh, and this is it. And he did sign it. It says, Jason, the best of luck in your, in your writing. Bill Richardson. And at the bottom it says, that is not dead which can lie eternal. And that's, of course, a, a quote by H.P. Lovecraft. And so it is my intention to finally get to this. I've, I've been behind... Uh, on some of these books that I have to read for the channel, but I'm gonna hopefully get to this very soon and I'm looking forward to reading it. Now let's get into the synopsis here. 
A terrifying evil wants to enter our world, and Dr. Max Heller and a group of Hellfighters are the only ones who can stop it. Heller is a man of science, but when he stumbles upon something that defies all logic, he must put aside his old ways of thinking and plunge into the unknown. In the tradition of H.P. Lovecraft comes a tale of cosmic horror that will have you on the edge of your seat. There are things in the universe beyond our understanding, malevolent, malevolent entities of immense powers. Can Heller and a ragtag group of townspeople prevail against such beings? Find out in this gripping tale filled with horrors more frightening than any nightmare. So, yeah, I've been meaning to get to this for a while now. Hopefully, in the spring, it will happen. All right. So, uh, a viewer on my channel, a Creature, you might know him as Creature, he, uh, he emailed me uh, a recommendation for a book that he... Uh, was currently reading when he emailed me and he he said it, it sounds like something right up my alley and he was he was right uh, i've been wanting to get into the uh, alien you know the 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 80s movies the 78 i think it was 79 movie alien and then aliens from like 84 i've been wanting to get into the the books and i even have this here uh it's an omnibus of like the first three books ever, I think, that were written within that world. I haven't gotten to it yet, but I, I keep planning to. Now there's a, another one here that, because I've been reading a lot of fantasy lately, uh, he said I might like, and it's Alien Phalanx by uh, Scott Sigler. Now here is the synopsis for this. It's medieval carnage meets alien. As a pre-industrial society fights against extinction, brought about by a massive infestation of xenomorphs. Atigina, I probably mispronounced the name of this place with that, but it's an isolated world of medieval castles, varied cultures and conquests, vibrant until the demons rose and spread relentless destruction. Swarms of lethal creatures with black husks, murderous claws, barbed tails, and dreaded tooth tongues raged through the lowlands, killing 90% of the planet's population. Terrified survivors fled to hidden mountains to keep, uh, to hidden mountain keeps where they eke out a meager existence. When a trio of young warriors discover a new weapon, they see a chance to end this curse. To save humanity, the trio must fight their way to the tunnels of Black Smoke Mountain, the lair of the mythical demon mother. <laughs> this sounds like sort of like uh, aliens in like an epic fantasy sort of setting. And that is, uh, it's also very uh, post-apocalyptical because uh, these, the, the alien the xenomorphs, they wipe out most of the, uh, the population. And so that just sounds like a lot of fun. I'm on board. <laughs> so thanks to Creature, his, uh, he has a channel of his own. I'll link it in the... Uh, in the show notes, and you can go check out and go give him a subscribe because he's uh, he's doing some pretty cool content himself. So that is Alien Phalanx by Scott Ziegler. Next up is uh, I was uh, I was just roaming for I don't even remember why, but I was I was looking at a, a Kindle Unlimited books uh, on my Kindle app uh, the other day, and I came across this one. It's called It Came from Space by Eddie Generous. Now. This book just sounded like a lot of fun, and so because it's technically free for me to, to download it onto my Kindle, because I am a, a Kindle Unlimited uh, member, so I uh, thought I'd give it a go at some point, so here is the synopsis for this book. The only way on or off Picture Island is by a two-hour ferry ride. The locals know how to get along without outside help, dealing with emergencies as they come. That was before something huge and monstrous crept from the ocean to discover it had a taste for human flesh. This mysterious creature is fast, strong, and seemingly impervious to human defenses. Can the locals stop this incredible beast, or will they be massacred in the name of a bloody buffet, all to feed a single insatiable hunger? <laughs> so that's It Came From Space by Eddie Generous. Now, I've never read anything by Eddie, Gener Eddie Generous, so uh, this is also a novella. It's like 100 pages long, 
So it should be a pretty quick read, maybe something you can polish off in, on a weekend uh, or in one sitting. So I'm hoping to do just that. Next up, I have a book that uh, I saw Rachel from Shades of Orange talk about on her channel before, at least once or twice. And this is like going back three or four years ago, I think. And I, I remember making a note that I wanted to read this book because it's a space horror book. And I went back to look for it because I didn't write it down, of course, nor did I put it in my Goodreads list at all. <laughs> so... Finally, she did a video recently where she uh, added this into one of her uh, recommended science fiction horror type of, uh, of books, if you're looking for that type of thing. And this was in her space horror section of that video. And it's Ghost The Ghost Line by Andrew Neil Gray and J.S. Herbison. This book sounds really cool because, as I said, it's space horror. And I've been in a bit of a space horror kick lately. So let's get into the synopsis. The Martian Queen was the Titanic of the stars before it was decommissioned, to, set to drift back and forth between Earth and Mars on the off chance that reclaiming it ever became profitable for the owners. For Sega and her husband, uh, Mitchell, the crew ship represents a massive payday. Hacking and stealing the ship could earn them enough to settle down, have children, and pay for the treatments to save Sega's mother's life. But the Martian Queen is much more than their employer has told them. In the 20 years since it was abandoned, something strange and dangerous has come to reside in the decadent vessel. Sega feels herself being drawn into a spider's web and must navigate the traps and lures of, awakening, of an awakening t intelligence if she wants to go home again. I've heard, I've heard this book described as a science fiction book with a lot of horror elements. So it'll be interesting to see exactly where that goes. Okay, next up, um, keeping with the uh, creature feature idea. Uh, I, and on the same day that I was looking at uh, and downloaded, it came from Outer or it came from Space by Eddie Generous. I came across one of uh, another author that I uh, really enjoy, and he's got a, a newer series out, and. This is the first book of that series, and it's The Land Below by William Meikle. Now, William, William Meikle, I haven't, he's a very prolif, uh, prolific writer, <laughs> and I haven't read nearly enough of his work, but I have read enough to know that I really enjoy reading William Meikle, and I want to read more, and I think this one sounds like a hell of a lot of fun. And so it's another novella. It's like 100 pages as well, 120 pages. And this, as I said, is book one, and there's, I think, three or four of them now. So let's get into the synopsis. A treasure hunt into the deepest cave system in Europe takes a turn for the worst. Now, rather than treasure, it is survival that is at the forefront of the Spelunkers' thoughts. But their attempts to escape out of the dark, deep places is thwarted. Men are not at home in the depths. There are things that are pale, terrifying things. Huge things. Things in re things red in tooth and claw, and uh, there's there's two more books in the series I have noted on the bottom of my list here, and uh, the other two books, if I like, I'm going to continue, and they are the sea below, and also the city below, so that sounds like a lot of fun. William Meikle really does uh, a fun pulp fiction. I think he's one of the the best pulp writers of today. And if you haven't checked him out, uh, he has, like I said, he's very prolific. He has a, a huge library of books all to his own. And a lot of them are, are pretty short, and so they're easy and fun to get through. And I highly recommend, I recommend reading anything by William Meikle. All right, next up I have a cosmic horror story that I've been wanting to get to for a long time. And that is The Immaculate Void by Brian Hodge. And now here is the synopsis for this. Brian Hodge is a really interesting writer. Uh, he, he, going into his work, you don't know exactly what to expect in terms of writing style or, uh, or, or, well, he has a voice all to its own. I, I described him by reading only like a handful of short stories by him. I, I described him as like an American modern uh, Robert Aikman. I don't know how accurate that is, but we're, I guess we'll see a little bit more 
if I do indeed get into the Immaculate Void. Uh, but this is a, a piece of cosmic horror. And here is the synopsis. When she was six, Daphne was taken into a neighbor's tool shed and came within seconds of never coming out alive. Most of the scars healed, except for the one that went all the way through. Two decades later, when Daphne goes missing again, it's nothing new. As her exes might agree, running is what she does best. So her brother Tanner sets out on <clears throat> one more time to find her. Whether in the mountains or in his own family, search and rescue is what he does best. Down two different paths, along two different timelines, Daphne and Tanner both find themselves trapped in a savage hunt for the rarest people on Earth by those who would slaughter them on behalf of ravenous entities that lurk outside of time. But in ominous signs that have traveled light years to be seen by human eyes, and that plummet from the sky, the ultimate truth is revealed. There are some things in the cosmos that terrify even the gods. I, I, I love the idea. <laughs> One thing that I love about this book is I'm... I really am a fan of uh, stories that take the idea of a missing person and then they return not knowing where they had been or or they return changed. And it's not just like a typical kidnapping story or anything like that. It's it's more uh, something happened to them and they maybe they were taken not just from everyone that they known that they know, not everyone's lives, but uh, taken from maybe even this reality and taken somewhere else, and then they come back. Uh, this is uh, this story sounds like it might be a little bit of that, but there's also some serious cosmic dread just within that last sentence. There are some things in the cosmos that terrify even the gods. <laughs> so that sounds really awesome. I'm hoping to get to that very shortly. All right, next up, I have another Brian Hodge story. I'll bring you the birds from Out of the Sky, this book was recommended to me uh, directly from Mark Allen Gunnels. Uh, I, I don't think he recommended this to me the last time I talked to him on the channel here, but he did recommend it to me, uh, I believe, on a Facebook Messenger, so we usually chat over there. Uh, here is the synopsis for this one. And I should mention that uh, both uh, The Immaculate Void and I'll Bring You the Birds from Out of the Sky are fairly short pieces uh, I think you could definitely, the Immaculate, or I'll Bring You the Birds from Out of the Sky is a novella, and the Immaculate Void is either novella length or maybe just a bit longer. All right, here's the synopsis for I'll Bring You the Birds. When Nona Conklin brings him a painting by the great-grandfather she never knew, gallery owner Timothy Randolph knows he's found the project of a lifetime. Curating a spectacular cache of folk art hidden for decades in the mountains of her home. The Conklin Collection is haunted and haunting, powerful in its brutal simplicity. What looks like the work of a fevered imagination begins to appear more and more like the desperate attempt of a man toiling at the edge of his limits to depict what cannot be depicted. An underlying order as old as the hills, its thousand throats concealed beneath the roots and rocks, beneath the streams and trees, deep in the besieged mountains of Appalachia. But the most crucial painting of all is missing, and the only place it could be is the last place that should be searched. <laughs> I'll Bring You the Birds from Out of the Sky is a tale of art and obsession, of dying heritage and cosmic horror, brought, by, brought to rustic life with full-color paintings. And it's that full-color paintings thing is from the... Uh, I believe the physical copy which you can buy uh, on Amazon or, or wherever so that that would be interesting the art by the way full color paintings is by artist Kim uh, Parkhurst should you uh, decide to go and pick that up so that might be really cool to get an illustrated copy of this book um, so another cosmic horror tale by, by Brian Hodge and uh, for some reason I always I always want to read more cosmic horror in the springtime it, it just seems to come naturally you would think that would be more of a, an autumn thing but I guess I'm just weird that way <laughs> all right uh, now we're getting into a 
couple of series that I want to start because I, re I recently read a book by uh, Lavi Tidhar called The Vanishing Kind. It was a, a an investigation, uh, police sort of procedure in uh, an alternate uh, history where the Nazis had won World War II and all things Jewish were banned and it was thought that the, the entire Jewish race was wiped out. Uh, it's a very strange book, and <laughs> it made me want to read more uh, investigatory uh, books set in Germany pre uh, pre Nazi uh, up before the Nazis took over. Basically, uh, the reason why is because this novel kind of reminded me a little bit of uh, uh, Babylon Berlin. A, a, TV series on Netflix that I, I have watched a little bit of, but not completely. When I'm watching a series on my own, I'm very awful at keeping it going, mostly because of my weird work schedule. I just don't have a regular schedule to watch TV. And and because my wife didn't really like it, uh, she never wanted to continue watching it with me, which is fine. But uh, I really enjoyed the show, and I wanted to read the books. And so reading that book made me think of the Babylon series, uh, Babylon Berlin series. Um, and so here's the synopsis for the first book in that, which is Babylon Berlin. And the series, I should say, is not called Babylon Berlin. It is called the Jaron Wrath series. I, I believe Jaron Wrath would be the uh, the name of the uh, the prime investigator. All right, Berlin, Berlin, 1929. Detective Inspector Wrath was a successful career officer in the Cologne Homicide Division before a shooting incident in which he inadvertently killed a man. He has been transferred to the Vice Squad in Berlin, a job he detests, even though he finds a new friend in his boss, Chief Inspector Walter. There is a seething unrest in the city, and the Commissioner of Police has ordered the Vice Squad to ruthlessly enforce the ban on May Day demonstrations. The result is catastrophic, with many dead and injured, and a state of emergency is declared in the communist strongholds of the city. When a car is hauled out of the Ber Berlin's Landwehr Canal with a mutilated corp inside, the commissioner decides to use this mystery t to divert the attention of the press and public from the casualties of the demonstrations. The biggest problem is that the corpse cannot be identified. So this book seems to have some parallels to certain things that are happening in today's world and I would like to to read it for that but I also want to read it because I'm really interested in uh, uh, 20th century Europe especially uh, the rise of the Nazis just this whole idea of uh, private investigators or in this case a, a police investigator uh, set during the time of when the Nazis were were taking over Germany and that to me just sounds like a lot of fun and so last on this list is March Violet by Philip Kerr. Uh, this is a very similar type of series. March Violet is the first uh, the first book in the Berlin Noir uh, series and here is the synopsis for that. It introduces readers to Bernie Gunther the ex-policeman who thought he'd seen everything on the streets of 1930s Berlin until he turned freelance, and each case he tracked or tackled sucked him further into the grisly excesses of Nazi subculture. Bernard Gunther, a hard-boiled Berlin detective who specializes in tracking down missing persons, mostly Jews, he is summoned by a wealthy industrialist to find the murderer of his daughter and son-in-law killed during the robbery of a priceless diamond necklace. Gunther quickly is captivated, or sorry, catapulted into a major political scandal involving Hitler's two main henchmen, Goring and Himmler. The search for the clues, the search for clues takes Gunther to morgues overflowing with Nazi victims, uh, ruckus nightclubs, the Olympic Games where Jesse Owens tra uh, tramples the theory of iron racial superiority, uh, the boudoir of a famous actress, and finally to the Dachau concentration camp. Fights with 
Gestapo agents, shootouts with adulterers, run-ins with a variety of criminals, and dead bodies in unexpected places keep readers guessing to the very end. Now, I think it should be mentioned that these books do take into uh, account the rise of Nazism in uh, 1930s Berlin, but I don't think that they in any way glorify Nazism. I think, if anything, they speak very much against them, and these series sort of take place during an interesting point of history where uh, this thing was happening. And it's interesting that we can read these books and see parallels to things that are happening in our own world today. Um, like I said, I don't think they glorify Nazism by any means. I think, if anything, they, they at their heart, detest the Nazis but we shall see. Maybe I am wrong in my assumptions. I'm hoping anyway that it shows Nazism in a horrible light that they should be displayed in. All right, so that is my spring TBR. There's no doubt going to be some changes along the way because I hardly ever stick to TBRs, but these are the books I'm really, really interested in reading right now. So let me know down deep down there in the darkness what you hope to be reading in the spring. And if you made it this far, Thank you so much. Uh, please leave an emoticon of books down there in the darkness as well, and I'll leave you a stack of books in return. Thank you. Keep being safe. Keep being creative. I'll catch you guys in the next bookish video.